So good evening, everybody. Um, we have actually two hosts tonight because this is a joint program of the Highland Park Historical Society and Culinary Historians of Chicago, or if we want in alphabetical order, Culinary Historians and the Highland Park Historical Society. But we're joined at the hip because I'm in the in-between stage. I do the programs for the Highland Park Historical Society for those of you who may not be aware of it. Anyway, I'm Catherine Lambrecht. Uh, so now I'm gonna turn this over to Scott Warner, who's the president of Culinary Historians, who does the programs for Culinary Historians. I'm just Kathy, I do the other program. Scott, are you there? Yeah, and um, welcome everybody to our meeting of the Culinary Historians of Chicago. And Kathy, I always say we're like the Smothers Brothers, Tom and Dickie, <laughs> and who, who you can't tell them apart. So uh, our groups, we each have our own group and we're joined at the hip. Uh, Kathy does Chicago Foodways Roundtable. And what's what's the name of the- Greater Midwest, Midwest Foodways and the Highland Park Historical Society. And if you really want the full plate, Illinois Mycological Association yeah, Mushroom you're, Club. You're a it's fun ridiculous, guy. I know. You're a fun guy, I tell you. I am, I'm a fun gal. Yes. and. Uh, and of course, I'm Culinary Historians of Chicago, and Kathy helps put the programs together. She's the glue sending out the notices and the emails and collects the dues and handles the website. So all I do is the programs. So anyway, now on to tonight's program. We're going to talk about the, it's, there's the, the, first, the first Christmas. Well, we're going to talk about the first Thanksgiving. Uh, John Oda will discuss the first Thanksgiving and any myths, facts, everything. We've got a whole bountiful plateful. John is, is, is this is our, his second time talking for us. He's discussed historic kitchens. Uh, you know, I lost track of time in 2020, right, Kathy? Right, he, John was our first speak, Zoom speaker. One of our first Zoom speakers, absolutely. After the pandemic hit. And John is in Canada. I just told John before the program started that I consider Canada, a wonderful suburb of the United States, but I know there's some Canadians listening. So, but I mean that as a term of endearment because I never consider Canada a foreign country, although they do speak kind of funny. But uh, anyway, uh, but that's about all the truth I have on that. Anyway, John has been involved with architecture and design since 1978. He's an architect. He has worked in architecture offices in Toronto, New York, and Vancouver and has degrees from the School of Architecture, Columbia University, and the University of British Columbia. He has also written articles on architecture and design for major newspapers and magazines across Canada. And he's an ardent foodie, as you, you would know if you heard him speak uh, two years ago for our group, um, he's, uh, when, he wrote, when he spoke about his book, The Kitchen. He's an active member of the Culinary Historians of Canada and John, could you take it away and speak clearly so we can understand you and understand okay. the accent? Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. You're Thank so you, Catherine. Welcome. So this is the Pilgrim Kitchen and the Harvest Celebration, 1621, 400 years ago. So my name is John Olta, and I love Thanksgiving. I'm going to take us on a whirlwind. 40 minute talk on the Pilgrim Kitchen and the Harvest Celebration 1621, also known as Thanksgiving. We'll barely touch the surface, but I hope this gives a taste of the history of this favorite holiday celebration. So thank you to Scott Warner and Catherine Lambrecht uh, and everybody in Chicago for tuning in here. And thank you to my friends from Canada who are also on this presentation. Thank you very much. I also want to thank Kathleen Wall, Pilgrim Foodways expert. Kathleen Wall is the culinary historian on the cooking techniques of the Mayflower settlers. Much of the information in this talk is thanks to Kathleen. And it just it's frozen, so we'll just click on that. There we go. This presentation on the Pilgrim Kitchen is the first chapter in my book titled The Kitchen published by Penguin Random House. The book is about my journey through history to find the perfect kitchen. So I visited the kitchens of Thomas Jefferson, Georgia O'Keeffe, Julia Child, Elvis Presley, and many others, and I cooked in those kitchens too. 
You can buy it at your favorite bookstore or online. The first kitchen that I visited for the book was the Pilgrim Kitchen, 1627 Plymouth, Ma Plymouth, Massachusetts. Even though there were earlier settlements in the New World, Plymouth for me is the spiritual beginning of the United States. If we could step into the time tunnel and set the dial for 1620, this is where we would land. I don't know if you remember this show, but these two guys would walk into the time tunnel and there'd be smoke and lightning and they'd go back in time. And we would go with them and we'd land on the Mayflower. In 1620, the Pilgrim sailed into Cape Cod Bay at Plymouth. At the same time, ships from England France, Spain, and Holland were sailing the high seas, jockeying to establish settlements in the New World. Above all, in 1620, the United States of America was not even a twinkle in anyone's eye. So you can see Plymouth here over on the top left, um, just where uh, Cape Cod gets attached to the mainland. When the pilgrims landed, they found the Wampanoag people who had lived there for over 12,000 years before them in 70 villages around Cape Cod. The Wampanoag possessed a complex society with their own governance, traditions, and religion. There could be no longer shot for survival than that faced by the pilgrims in 1620. Amid turmoil, setbacks, and confusion, the pilgrims set out from England to make their famous voyage across the Atlantic Ocean aboard the Mayflower and founded Plymouth Colony. I think it's one of the most fascinating stories in humankind. We're at Plymouth Patuxet Museum in Plymouth, Massachusetts, a historical site that was reconstructed near the site of the original Plymouth uh, village. Although the town's name is now Plymouth, spelled with a Y, there were no firm rules for English spelling in the early 1600s. So Plymouth, spelled with an I, was used by the colony's second governor, William Bradford, and is the version adopted by the museum. I've arranged to meet Kathleen Wall at the museum entrance. I've signed up for her hardcore hearth cooking class. I came to learn about Pilgrim Kitchen and to make Pilgrim dishes in a 1627 kitchen. So there's Kathleen and pilgrims wore colorful clothes. The black suits and the tall hats and those big belt buckles are a myth fabricated by artists a hundred years later who copied clothes of Dutch citizens in black suits. So Kathleen suggests that I walk up to the pilgrim village, acclimatize myself to the 1620s and then join her inside one of the pilgrim houses. So I set out towards the Plymouth Plantation Village along a dirt path that meanders through an oak forest. I walk through a Wampanoag village, which shows the traditional ways of the Wampanoag people who were here and greeted the colonists when they came in 1620. And I love how the native story is told alongside the pilgrim story at this historic site. The Wampanoag lived in communal longhouses and cooked in the center of the floor plan. The native people, told the colonists where to fish, hunt, and how to grow maize. And this is a shot of the smoke hole in the top of that longhouse. So the, the smoke could get out. The pilgrims were actually city people. They did not know how to hunt or fish or farm. They all would have starved without the natives. The Wampanoag, like most Eastern woodland people, had a varied and extremely good diet. The forest provided chestnuts, walnuts, beech nuts, they grew multicolored corn and that was their staple. They grew beans, pumpkins, and squashes. 80% of the Eastern woodland native diet came from agriculture. Here are some images of that um, native village, the Wampanoag village. This is a, a bowl of this corn porridge. We'll talk a little bit more about that later in the talk. And they also, of course, went into the forest and hunted game and roasted it. In the distance, I see a palisade of wood poles rising out of a hillside, and the path leads me through the gates of a fort. I'm reminded that the, the pilgrims built this settlement in the middle of a Massachusetts winter. It was very cold. In an instant, I find myself in front of a panoramic view of wood cottages spilling down a main street to the waters of Cape Cod Bay. I walk down the street towards the ocean, 
On both sides of me, along the dirt road are 18 wood structures, including houses, outbuildings, and a large meeting house. They're stark boxes topped by peak roofs that rise sharply like witches' hats. Wood walls beaten by the sun and wind and the thatch roofs that you can see there give the houses a monochromatic gray wash. In the background, cattle and sheep roam in the fields. There's a strong scent of wood smoke in the air. The scene matches what I would imagine a medieval English village looked like. As I look around, I'm surprised by the complete absence of log cabins, which feature in every illustration of pilgrim life I've ever seen. So it turns out that those log cabins in those paintings are a myth, again by painters of a later period trying to romanticize the American frontier. And I think that also that those painters painted scenes with log cabins because they were much more interesting and, and much more uh, 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 colorful to, uh, to paint. They could sell their paintings more easily than if they had these gray uh, uh, drab houses in the background. So the pilgrims built what they were used to living in, which were English cottages. The frame was heavy timbers. For the walls, they used a wattle and daub method. So wattle is uh, a woven lattice of wood strips. And you can see that in between these little posts. When they filled in the, the spaces, they did it with a mud called daub. You can see the daub over here on the right. Then they would protect the wall with clapboard. And here's, a, here's a, something out of my sketchbook. Just on the top uh, is a, a plan of that Plymouth plantation with the main street going down to Cape Cod Bay. I head on the road. I see Kathleen bustling around outside a house, making final arrangements for her class. I'm getting excited. So she welcomes me to the Pilgrim House where we'll be cooking a 1620s meal. And I'm joined by a cooking mate named Meryl Bloor, a person from Plymouth who's also signed up for the cooking course. Meryl was great. She was a great person to cook with. When the settlers arrived in Plymouth in December, they set out to build houses with axes, saws, and hammers that they brought with them. They cut down trees and built their houses by hand in the cold, in the winter, with lots of snow and wind blowing around them, it must have been miserable. The pilgrim built houses have no hint of embellishment or individual expression. There's no welcome ornament at the front door or brackets at the uh, roof overhang. The houses present an attitude of self-effacement and humility. And this is an architecture that reflects a Puritan culture of work and devotion, the central themes of pilgrim life. There was always work to do. Decorating a house was considered a waste of time in God's eyes. The pilgrims liked to work. They had a strong work ethic. They felt they were serving God when they were working. Today, we tend to be the opposite. You know, we like leisure. We want to go on a Viking river cruise and just take it easy. But for the pilgrims, darning socks would be relaxation. Kathleen guides me to the front door, but as I step inside the doorway and try to look around, I find I'm in complete darkness. Eventually my eyes adjust and I'm able to peer into a single room of about 14 feet by 20 feet. And I can see that the interior is rough and spare. You can see that there's just the mud walls, the dirt floor, the, the logs up above were exposed. The kitchen is the entire one room house. You can see the mud walls in this too. It was the bedroom, living and dining room for a family of six to 10 people. Suddenly I start to cough and sneeze and my eyes tear up. <laughs> Just, it's, it's terrible in there. It's black smoke is everywhere and I have trouble breathing. I turn around and see an open fire burning in a pit against the wall at the front of the house. It's really terrible in there. Fire is the focus of the house. There's no brick fireplace. This is simply a campfire on a dirt floor. The pilgrims had no bricks and no time to build a fireplace. The main thing was to have shelter while they planted crops that would keep them alive. And smoke, when I was in there, was everywhere. It was in my eyes, it was in my hair, my face. It was miserable. 
The fire was the visual focal point, but also the source for heat to cook food, warmth during the winter months, and light at night. Elevated about eight feet above the open fire is a chimney shaft that reaches through the rafters. Kathleen hung pots above the fire from a single branch embedded in the sides of the chimney. You can see that right there. A sturdy wood table in the middle of the room acts as the prep counter. The walls are framed in wood and have a mud gray plaster finish. There's no mystery in this kitchen. There's no grandeur. Whatever is in the room is there just to support cooking. It's very, very bland, very drab, as you can see. As Kathleen arranges ingredients around the central kitchen table, she announces that one of the dishes we'll be preparing is duck. My mouth waters instantly. I can practically taste that crispy, chewy duck skin. But then she adds that we'll be boiling it. What? What? I had pictured a sizzling duck roasting on a spit with glistening duck fat dripping into the open fire. And she says that colonists boiled everything, including geese and salads. They used the cooking liquid for soups and sauces. Okay, okay, I'm ready for anything. No problem, I'm ready to try anything. If you wanted meat on the table, you had to shoot it yourself. Waterfowl such as mallard and teal ducks and cormorants were plentiful in Cape Cod Bay and the pilgrims hunted them with their rifles. And you can see this gentleman with his long rifle on his shoulder here. Once the men shot and gathered the ducks, it was the responsibility of the women to pluck and gut. And thank goodness I've been spared the plucking and gutting duties by Kathleen bringing an already clean duck for our cooking session. Kathleen plops the duck into a deep pot and pours water over it until the duck is half submerged. She covers the pot and places it on a vertical hanger above the open flame. The hanger has several hooks at different levels that allow the cook to hang the vessel lower or higher to control the heat. So this is the equivalent of modern day, we go to the stove and we turn a knob and it goes from high down to medium to low. So these uh, pilgrim cooks would move, just move the pot up and down above the fire. Kathleen tells me that after the liquid comes to a boil in the pot, we'll be adding vegetables uh, to the pot. We'll be add, taking the lid up and adding vegetables. So here's a duck recipe, a boiled duck recipe. It's uh, an old English recipe from the 1600s to boil a duck with turnips. And that's what we're gonna be doing. Take her first and put her into a pot with stewed broth. Then take parsley and sweet herbs and chop them and parboil the roots very well in another pot. Then put unto them sweet butter, cinnamon, ginger, pepper, and mace and so season it with salt and serve it upon sops. So sops are pieces of bread, eventually evolved into things on toast, such as hot beef sandwich with gravy. So this is, this is a 1600s duck boiled duck recipe. Pretty good. I think it's pretty good with cinnamon, ginger, pepper, mace. The Puritans were a religious group who left their homeland in the 1600s because they wanted to practice a simpler faith than that of the Church of England. They objected to stained glass, cathedrals, and choirs. They were named after their desire to purify the church. Mayflower arrived in New England on November the 11th, 1620, after a difficult voyage that took two months. There were many delays, negotiations, disagreements. Originally, there were two ships, but one of them, the Speedwell, sprang a leak, and they had to go back to England and start again. In fact, they had to do that twice. So they lost over a whole month. Over the two months that they were at sea, they were terribly seasick. They were ill and poorly nourished. They were eating uh, uh, ship food, like hardtack and, and salted, salted meat. Conditions on board were unsanitary. They just used chamber pots, People were getting ill all the time because they were seasick. They lived below deck in a cramped five foot high space. So they always had to bend down all the time. And they were really cramped together in there. Everybody suffered from the cold weather, from the violent storms and their weakened health. 
When they finally found a place to settle, they named it New Plymouth after their last port of call back home. As they built their village, they met a Native American named Squanto, who was able to communicate with the pilgrims in English. Squanto had been kidnapped by English explorers in 1614 and learned the language while he was a captive in London. And Squanto is really the hero of the pilgrim story. He taught them to plant corn and where to fish and where to hunt. And the pilgrims would not have survived without him. During that first winter, many colonists fell ill with scurvy and pneumonia. Of the original 102 passengers, only 52 survived the first year in Plymouth. They lost half their number. Food was a continuous preoccupation for the colonists. Their daily life revolved around it, hunting, fishing, farming, cooking, salting, smoking, and drying were used to preserve meat and fish. Vegetables were picked in vinegar, pickled in vinegar and sugar. Preparation of food would be ongoing, sunrise to sunset. So the next task is to start preparing our quails. And here's Meryl, she's gonna help prepare the, help join us and, and prepare the quails. I take a big step backwards when Kathleen unsheathes an enormous samurai sword and drops it on the table with a thud. On closer examination though, I see it's not a sword at all, but a long steel rod with pointed ends used to skewer quails and rotate them on the fire. So Kathleen unwraps a package of about a dozen quails, these small birds that the pilgrims hunted at Plymouth. Again, I'm grateful that the birds have been pre-cleaned and plucked. And she, Kathleen proceeds to impale the quails in one long row on, on, that, uh, on that steel rod. The skewered birds are then covered in globs of butter. Then the rod is placed on two steel brackets over the low flame. Kathleen bends down to place a long dish under the birds to catch the drippings that she'll use to baste the birds. She tells me that the pilgrims brought butter with them on the Mayflower. It was a staple in the 17th century, she says, sailors were allotted one pound of butter or one pound of cheese per day. So here's a quail recipe from 1594. Let his legs be broken and knit one within another and so roast him. Not wasting any time with words in this cookbook. 1594, good housewives handmade in the kitchen, 1594. But maize or corn became a staple for the pilgrims and they baked it into bread and cakes. The corn that grew was made up of multicolored kernels of red, yellow, and black on the same ear. The corn was dried and then ground into flour. The Wampanoag ground this between stones and made a bread that they laid directly in the fire as a method of baking. Pilgrim women made their own version by boiling the corn, then pounding the corn and pouring it onto the floor of the outdoor communal oven to make a chewy flatbread. First, they'd build a fire in the oven to heat the chamber. When the oven was hot enough, oh, see, we, we've, we've built a fire here. When, oh, now it's really roaring. When, they, when it gets really hot in there, they let it burn down. They remove the logs and then they lay the bread in the oven and plug the opening. The opening is plugged here the bread baked from the heat given off by the hot walls. Here's a, an example of, uh, of the flatbread that the pilgrims uh, uh, made and ate, almost like a, a chewy focaccio, that kind of thing. And here's a, a, a recipe for hasty pudding from 1672, made with, with uh, cornmeal. So the English make a kind of loblolly of it to eat with milk, which they call somp, they beat it into a mortar and sift the flour out of it. The remaining that they call hominy, which they put in a pot of two or three gallons with water and boil it upon a gentle fire till it be like hasty pudding. They put of this into milk and so eat it. So Jocelyn John, New England's Rarities, 1672. Now it's time to get the vegetables going, she, Kathleen says. She harvested these vegetables just minutes ago from the Plymouth Gardens. 
and they're the same varieties of vegetables the pilgrims would have eaten in the 1620s. A wood table is covered in fresh vegetables, including large bulbous turnips, leafy cabbages, oblong squash, and orange pumpkins. We start the task of cleaning, peeling, and chopping. Kathleen hands me a bucket of water, a rag, and an old knife, and I start my work as a pilgrim cook. You know, and it's hard manual labor. For one thing, those turnips are covered in dirt, and uh, they're kind of awkward and slippery. The pilgrims kept them in the ground as long as possible to improve their taste, Kathleen tells me. Our turnip washing goes well, but hollowing them out and peeling is a different story. You have to cut off the top, reach down and pull out the seeds and all the stringy pulp. Next, we chop up the rock hard flesh into small segments. And the final task is peeling off the turnip skin with an old knife and the pumpkin skin as well. And, and Kathleen hands me these really small dull knives and it's kind of hurting my fingers and I'm not very happy about it. This is a lot more work than I expected chopping these things, these into small bits, they're hard. I gotta take the peel off. I'm not very happy about this. It's hard work, it's hard work. Here's a recipe for turnip, 1634. So turnip, scrape them, blanch them, and seize them with water, butter and salt. After they are enough, put them in a dish with very fresh butter, and you may put some mustard served with nutmeg. London, 1634 from maids who brew and bake. So this is pretty good. I mean, I, this is 1634. I'm not sure you'd make turnips any different today with fresh butter. You can put some mustard in and serve with nutmeg. It sounds very good to me. And food preparation and cooking would be never ending. Pilgrims usually ate three meals a day, starting with bread, butter, and cheese in the morning. At noon, they had dinner, their largest meal of the day. It might be meat, fish, or fowl with turnips or pumpkin and bread. A small meal of leftovers was eaten at the end of the day, and the pilgrims ate with their hands. They had spoons and knives, but forks were not invented yet. So a cloth draped over the shoulder was used for wiping fingers and picking up hot food. So you can see those uh, cloths draped over their shoulders. And look at the size of that lobster. My goodness, I've never seen such a big lobster. It's so funny. Um, so Kathleen tells me our next task is to prepare the spices for cooking. And the pilgrims brought a surprising number of cooking spices with them, including salt, pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg, mace, and ginger. I naturally assume that we'll be working with meat little uh, salt and pepper shakers, you know, uh, uh, and bottles of powdered nutmeg lined up on the table. Bah, wrong again. In the low light of the kitchen, I can make out the table is covered in odd bowls, sticks, cones, scraps of unidentifiable objects, as well as a mortar and pestle. So in an aha moment, aha, I realized that I'm expected to prepare the spices the 17th century way by grinding them with that mortar and pencil. So I'm here, this is great. I'm here to cook like a pilgrim. So we go at it, here we go. And you know what, I'm smiling for the camera, but I'm not really happy because this is hard work and it's smoky and it's hot and I'm sweating. So, and I, I paid to go to, a, I paid to go to this cooking glass and I'm working really hard. It's really hot work. So I love ginger. That's the first ingredient I picked to grind down. And the, the kind of the, that the pilgrims had were these little sheets of, uh, of, of ginger, dried ginger, they almost like little sheets of paper, scraps of paper. So I place one in the bottom of the stone mortar and begin to grind it with a pestle. And I grind and I grind and I grind. But after, after a couple of minutes, I stop and look down into the bottom of the bowl. And of course, I expect to see perfectly ground powdered ginger. But nothing has happened. Nothing has happened. The sheet of dried ginger is exactly the same as when I put it in a pestle. All I can think of, would somebody please get me a Cuisinart? But my good, would somebody please get me a Cuisinart? So we continue with peppercorns and then chunks of salt. The process dictates that we grind one spice at a time using the mortar and pestle is an exercise in patience and in endurance. 
So here's Meryl going at the mortar and pestle. I think she's much better at it than me. And I realized later, you just have to lean over, get all your weight down on that, on that to do the grinding. Kathleen moves to the fire and bends down to remove the lid from the pot. Inside, the duck is boiling in what is now a fatty broth. She drops into the broth the turnip that I've chopped, adds salt and pepper, and a sprinkle of nutmeg. And in the meantime, the quails are roasting. And look at that fire. That's really hot. Those, those embers are, are red hot. You can see that. The next step is to fry the chunks of pumpkin over the fire. And Kathleen reaches for a frying pan with a handle that's about three feet long. She places a dollop of butter in the pan. At first, the elongated handle strikes me as quite curious, you know, but its purpose becomes clear when Kathleen places the pan right into the hot embers of the fire to allow the butter to melt. And I can see that the long handle allows the cook to maneuver the pan in the fire without getting scorched. So Kathleen takes the frying pan off the fire. I plunk into it the chunks of pumpkin that I've lovingly chopped up and peeled. And here she is stirring the pumpkin chunks in over the fire. We all take a turn. And even while I uh, have the, the handle three feet away from me, I still feel this heat scorching my face. I'm covered in sweat. Even, 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 even though I'm, I'm back from the fire, it's really hot and it's really sweaty and smoking. After four hours of washing, chopping, peeling, grinding, roasting, basting, boiling, frying, our meal is finally ready to be plated. And considering the ingredients and the simplicity of the recipes, I am not expecting much in the way of taste. In fact, I'm expecting a series of very bland dishes consistent with the plain interior of the Pilgrim house. If Pilgrim life was so devoted to work and a lack of enjoyment, why would their food be any different? So I'm expecting a bland, bland, bland. But as Kathleen removes the lid, off the pot, the aroma of the cooked duck is surprisingly enticing. She, you know, the, you can get the fumes from the pot coming up. Kathleen slices off pieces from the breast and the thigh and places the steaming meat on my plate. She surrounds the duck with chunks of turnip and ladles on the broth that glistens with pearls of duck fat. And I'm breathing this all in and it smells really good. The first morsel of meat proves all my preconceptions completely wrong. I'm in shock. The duck braised to a melting tenderness is delicious. The broth is thick enough perfectly and the salt, pepper and nutmeg have transformed the dish into a delectable stew. Even the turnips al dente and infused with duck fat are exquisite. Look at that, it was really good. I'm anxious now to try the roasted quail that's been dripping buttery fat from the spit and turned a deep golden brown. Kathleen strips the spit of the birds and places one on my plate. She covers the bird with buttery gravy. I cut off a leg and take a bite. It's sensational. Salty, peppery, tender, and smoky. The meat slides off the bone. I've never enjoyed, enjoyed quail or any fowl so much. The flavor is intense and all that butter basting has made the skin golden brown and crispy. And you know, when you're eating it, I love those little brown bits at the ends of the bone that you can kind of just sort of chew on. It's, I love that. So it was very good. But the biggest surprise is the pumpkin. I've tasted pumpkin pie, but I have no other experience eating pumpkin before. So these beautifully caramelized cubes of orange goodness turn out to be as flavorful as they look, fried crunchy crust on the outside and soft pillowy flesh on the inside. The cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, salt, and pepper release a pumpkin party in my mouth. And here's that buttery sauce from the quails. And the quails with the buttery sauce on top and all on top of the pumpkin. So it's delicious. It's great. It's not what I expecting. I was expecting. But the key, as we're all culinary historians, the key is fresh. Fresh duck, fresh quail, and fresh vegetables right out of the ground. 
As we devour our dinner, here's Kathleen. Kathleen shares with me her intimate knowledge of Thanksgiving that she's gained as a culinary historian at Plymouth. By the fall of 1621, 400 years ago to this time, the Pilgrims had built seven houses, a meeting hall, and three storehouses for food and other supplies. After barely surviving that first winter, they had much to be thankful for, not the least the natives, without whose generosity and sharing knowledge and resources, without them, they would have starved to death. Kathleen tells me the pilgrims and the natives did not necessarily love each other as is sometimes portrayed in popular culture. In fact, they did not even like each other. However, they needed each other to survive and they cooperated as allies. The Wampanoag were able to fight off neighboring enemies with the help of the pilgrims, while the pilgrims needed the natives for their knowledge of hunting, fishing, and agriculture. So thanks to Squanto, and the natives, in 1621, the harvest was a good harvest, and it was the first time they had grown maize. Governor William Bradford hosted a celebratory feast. They were joined by Massasoit, chief of the Wampanoag, and 90 of his men. So there were 50 pilgrims and 90 Wampanoag coming together and eating together. The story of the harvest celebration is about two very different communities that came together invested in each other and became stronger through a combined effort. Massasoit, the Wampanoag leader, sent his men out to bring back five deer, which he gave to the pilgrims and was a huge contribution to the feast. For the English, this was fabulous. Most people in England at the time ate poorly. They ate bread, fish, and scraps. Eating deer or venison was an elite tradition in England and was only eaten by royalty, nobles, and the extremely wealthy. Deer and other animals in the forests were owned by the king. Hunting the king's deer would result in severe fines or even death. So for the English, deer was a complete luxury to eat. There was no butcher shop in the 1600s for them to buy deer. So this was an incredible meeting of the pilgrims and the Wampanoag, and they were ready to celebrate. The pilgrims had been through so much misery, losing half of their numbers. The Wampanoag had been struck with disease, terribly with disease that tragically killed entire villages. So both groups had been through horrific times. They celebrated for three days. That's a lot of celebrating. So today we have one big dinner, watch some NFL football, and then go home. They had three days of meals. Over the three days, they ate, they talked, they smoked, they had competitions and games and showed off their weaponry. And as you know, when men get together, that's what they're prone to do. It doesn't matter who they are or what century they're living in. That's what guys tend to do. So what did they eat? What we really do not know for sure but there are written passages from Bradford in his journals. We know what they did not eat. They did not have Starbucks pumpkin spice lattes, but these lattes are genuine in that they used pumpkin, ginger, cinnamon, and nutmeg flavors in the same ways that the pilgrims made their fried pumpkin. They did not have mashed potatoes, white potatoes originating in South America and sweet potatoes from the Caribbean had yet to come to North America. There was no pumpkin pie. The colonists did not have wheat flour to make crusts for pie. And this dessert, pumpkin pie, did not show up on Thanksgiving tables until the early 1800s. There was no sweet potato with marshmallows. In 1917, the Angeles Marshmallows Company distributed a book that taught Americans how they might use marshmallows. The first marshmallows were a luxury, but marshmallows became more affordable after gelatin was substituted for marshmallow root. And there was no green bean casserole. Green bean casserole was invented in 1955 by the Campbell Soup Company as a way to market cream of mushroom soup. We know what they might have eaten. So they might have eaten cranberries, not the sauce though, but they might have, they might have mashed it up, but you know, they did not have cranberry sauce. 
And there were other berries available as well. Indigenous people had long eaten these berries. Beer. So this is controversial. If there was a beer, there were only a few gallons for 150 people for three days. And we know they drank beer on the way over on the Mayflower. They drank that instead of water, sort of a watered down beer. But Kathleen thinks that the English and the Wampanoag uh, drank mostly water. Turkey. Yes, there was Turkey, but Turkey was not the centerpiece. Turkey in Plymouth were plentiful and big, but they were not the only bird on the table. They also had ducks, geese, quails, Passenger pigeons and even swans could have been there. So the colonists, as I said before, boiled everything. They might even have boiled the first Thanksgiving turkey too. So there were lots of different fish as well, cod, eels, and, sh and shellfish. They might have boiled the, these turkeys because if they were big turkeys, they're probably old turkeys and, and the meat would have been tough if you, they roasted it. So, so boiling them would be a way of tenderizing the turkey, and then they could use uh, the liquid for soups and for salads. But according to Bradford's journals, turkey was not the main event, deer was, and the meat came from the Wampanoag, and the pilgrims loved to eat meat. So for these meals, they were in heaven. There was meat, 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 and more meat. Here's a, a recipe from 1661 to bake beef like red deer. So take a buttock of beef, cut it the long ways with the grain, beat it well with a rolling pin. They wanna make this like deer. Then broil it through with lard, lay it in some white wine vinegar, pepper, salt, cloves, mace, and bay leaves, and let it lie three or four days. So they're beating it and then they're marinating it. Then they bake it, then bake it in rye paste, and when it is cold, fill it with butter. After a fortnight, it will be eaten. 1661, William Rabishaw, the whole body of cookery dissected. Oh, and here's, here's Winslow. So since we're talking about food, I just have to mention a pilgrim named Edward Winslow, who I've really come to admire. So Edward Winslow was one of the most important and perhaps the least remembered pilgrims. Without Winslow, Plymouth might not have survived. So Winslow um, played a critical role in becoming friends with the Wampanoag people. He was highly educated. He was sensitive to the native people and a natural diplomat. He was interested in learning more about the Wampanoag and their beliefs and their customs. So he visited their village. He stayed with them. He observed their life, understood their culture, tried to learn the language and, and stayed with them. So, and, and then he recorded his experiences like an anthropologist. So Winslow had an excellent relationship with Massasoit. When the, when the chief was seriously ill, Winslow walked to his village and reportedly nursed him back to health with chicken soup. Even in the 1620s, chicken soup was a cure and Massasoit was very grateful to Winslow for nursing him back to health. The real mover and shaker of Thanksgiving was Sarah Josepha Hale, editor of the popular women's magazine, Gotti's Ladies Book, a real trendsetter in the home. She was the Martha Stewart of her time. Hale was a leading voice in making Thanksgiving an annual event. Beginning in 1827, Hale petitioned 13 presidents, 13 presidents, the last of whom was Abraham Lincoln. So in 1861, with the outbreak of the Civil War, Sarah became even more determined that a national day of Thanksgiving would unite the country. She wrote, putting aside the sectional feelings, would it not be more noble, more truly American to become nationally in unity when we offer to God our tribute of joy and gratitude for the blessings of the year? In September 1863, Sarah Josepha Hale wrote to Abraham Lincoln. Five days later, in response to that letter, the president proclaimed Thanksgiving a national holiday. Throughout her campaign, Hale printed Thanksgiving recipes and menus in Gandhi's Ladies Book. And she also wrote cookbooks. And as Kathleen told me, what she's really doing is she's planting this idea in the heads of lots of women that this is something that they should want to do. So when the day comes 
when there's finally a national day of Thanksgiving, there's a whole body of women who are ready for it, who know what to do because Hales told them what to do. And I think, I think this is such a funny card, Thanksgiving card. Look at the size of that turkey. That turkey's like the size of a, of, a, of a raptor dinosaur. If I was those kids, I'd be running away. But I guess people want <laughs> big turkeys. <laughs> Look at the size of that pumpkin. Many of the Thanksgiving dishes we have today, roast turkey with stuffing, mashed turnips, mashed potatoes are in Gotti's Ladies Book by Sarah. So all I can say is three cheers for Sarah Josepha Hale and three cheers for Thanksgiving. In conclusion, it's true that life was hard in Plymouth, but the pilgrims believed they had a future there. Life had not been good for them in England. And in spite of their challenges, they felt that they could do better in the new world and they stayed. This is the story of so many immigrants. They want a better life for themselves and for their children. They're willing to put up with threats and poverty and even risk their lives for the hope of a better future. And in this case, religious freedom. After three difficult years, life did improve for the pilgrims. They got better at fishing, trapping, hunting and growing crops. They were able to acquire beaver furs, and by 1627, the value of beaver furs was on the rise in Europe. In fact, beaver furs quadrupled in price, so they were able to turn a profit. More colonists arrived, and by 1627, Plymouth had a population of about 160. 400 years ago, 50 pilgrims and 90 Wampanoag enjoyed the harvest celebration of 1621 and eating was at the center of it. To this day, offering food is a way to express friendship, gratitude, generosity, and empathy. When words fail, we can express ourselves through food. In the darkest, most terrible times, food is a comfort. This is what the pilgrims must have felt during the first horrific winters at Plymouth. The pilgrims were conservative people. They were dedicated to God. The severity of their religion, limited their pleasures in life, but they enjoyed eating. It might have been their greatest pleasure. Pilgrim life was hard, but at least their food was tasty. I'm glad it was a comfort for them. Happy 400th anniversary Thanksgiving to you. Thank you so much for having me here today. You can visit Plymouth Patuxent Museum in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Their website is Plymouth.org. That's Plymouth with an I dot org. Thank you. It was so nice to meet you. My email address is roota at rogers.com. So that's R-O-W-E-O-T-A at rogers.com. I'd love to hear from you. Send me a line tomorrow, next week, next year. I'd love to hear from you. It was so nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Karen, thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> that, that was luscious history. It kind of remind me of Ken Burns on PBS with the with the way you you illustrated our Thanksgiving and uh, uh, it, it, really in depth. And I I learned things I didn't know, and uh, uh, just luscious. And we are going to open up the uh, program to chat questions right now. So if you have any questions for John and a number of you have already put your questions in chat and Kathy will read the questions and John will answer. And uh, I do have one big question for you, John. This is the second time you've talked for us, talked to our group. And are, are, are you working on something else for the future? I, uh, you know, Scott, that's very nice of you to ask. I just write for myself and sort of look out there and, and, you know, researching is so much fun. Research is the best part. So I research this, I research that. And in the end, if something looks good, then that's great. That's great. And, and um, um, I had a really uh, excellent time researching this Thanksgiving talk and, and, Along the way, I, I found out so much. So that's that's really the fun of it all. And I'm always writing and poking around. And 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 especially, I love architecture. 
and food and eating and history. So um, it, it's always fun to be to be doing this kind of work. Thank you. So keep us in mind your next project because we would <laughs> love to hear back from you. Right. Uh, this this was wonderful, wonderful history and beautifully illustrated. So Kathy, uh, would you care to to uh, ah. put on your chat hat and uh, can proceed? <laughs> A chat hat. Uh, it, so there, there was a kind of, you mentioned the beer on the ship. Uh, were there any kinds of, you know, were there, uh, what other kinds of beverages did the bil pilgrims enjoy? Would there have been any wine, beer, maybe that was off limits? Was there fruit drinks? Was it just water? On the ship, Coffee, they just tea? had, they had hardtack, biscuits. I mean, they ate uh, ship food when they came over. So it was hardtack. They had pea soup. Uh, and they had that beer and, and they would have had salted meat, whether it was salted pork, I think it was salted pork. And that's about it. I mean, that's what, um, that's what sailors had. So when they came over, they were um, uh, at the mercy of the, of the sailors when they were coming over. And it was a miserable journey. So they had reduced food like that. They were ill. The sailors were profane. And um, at the last, one of the last minute, uh, when, when the pilgrims came over, when the, uh, the investors, people were in, uh, had invested money in the settlement, the investors insisted that half their people uh, that, uh, be uh, outsiders. So on the ship, the, the pilgrims, the, the Puritans, who were very religious people, had to mix uh, with an equal number of outsiders. Uh, who are also profane and rough people. So not only uh, were they poorly nourished and ill, they were with people who they really did not know and did not get along with. And this came to a head when they, they landed in, uh, in Cape Cod and um, there were disagreements and uh, it, it led to something called the Mayflower Compact that they um, assigned, made an agreement. Basically what they said was, um, we're uh, so far north of, of New York Harbor where we really wanted to go. We're in Cape Cod. We don't really think that the, um, the restrictions and the things that we were supposed to do applies to us now. And so although we're still, uh, we're still uh, loyal to, to the investors, we want to, if we all get together and we decide this is what we want to do as as a group that benefits our group, that's what we're going to do. And uh, that, 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 that eased the tension of the different groups coming together and they could actually live together. Now, just to clarify, the, the pilgrims did not brew beer or they did brew beer. They did, they, they, they did I don't know how they did it, but they, they, uh, they drank beer, yeah. Okay, so that was sort of like, the water not being good. So they yes, yes, they would. That they, was the safest be, beverage. Yes, yeah, it's much okay. better for them to drink this this weak of beer. Um, okay, Jacqueline Ottman, she she has a special interest in in um, let's say sal. Well, never mind. Uh, I was going to say something that was going to sound strange, uh, but she had a question that was actually over two. <laughs> things but she wanted to know if the leftovers they experienced were sort of like would have been cut tonight's codfish would have been tomorrow's cod cakes and one meal yes, they would have rolled yes. into the other yes and that would have been the dinner uh, that's the your third impression meal of the day yeah yeah okay um did the pilgrims native americans have honey at the feast i don't know i don't know um the, the, what we know that they ate, there's not a lot of detail. They might have had honey. That that um, that might might have happened. Uh, uh, this uh, any information we have on the pilgrims and the situation comes from uh, Bradford's journals, and Bradford um, lived it lived into his 60s, so he had a lot of time to record his uh, his memories of of what happened. Uh, there's not a lot of detail actually on the uh, the actual dinner of of the uh, of of the harvest celebration. He writes that um, that the 
uh, Wampanoag came out of the forest, joined them for dinner, and uh, they did. They did this. They they uh, brought the five deer. They had competitions. They had wrestling. They had uh, they had a good time, and they they ate for three days. But that's more or less as much as we know, uh, because it 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 comes out of a diary. So there's, there's uh, a lot of a lot of uh, some some conjecture about about uh, how this all happened. He actually does not say that he invited them, but it makes a lot of sense that he invited them because their village is about thirty miles away. They wouldn't have come all that way if they were not invited. And and you can imagine that that Bradford and Winslow would have thought it was a good idea. Um, uh, Cynthia Clampett offered that. Uh with the honey was probably, I'm just saying what she wrote, honey was introduced via Jamestown, so oh. they would have not had honey. Um, they said if they had any anything sweet, it would have been maple or birch syrup. Mm. I'm just offering, yes. just to perhaps That's fill true. in the cracks. Yeah. Um, now, were the pilgrims, the Native Americans, likely to have had meals together after that Thanksgiving or on other occasions? Oh, they would have, yes. The, uh, there's no record of that, but the Wampanoag and the pilgrims were very strong allies, at least for the next 20 years. And after that, uh, after that, more people from England come and the, uh, the indigenous people just get outnumbered. But they were strong allies, and um, Bradford actually got married, remarried. His his uh, wife uh, died when they first arrived uh, in Cape Cod. He remarried in Massasoit was at the wedding, so um, they were very strong allies. And and as I said, uh, Winslow um, nursed Massasoit back to health, and uh, Massasoit was very grateful about that. So. If, you know, even though, uh, and later um, uh, the uh, pilgrims and the, and the Wampanoag came to odds, and uh, it's, it's a, a very sad ending for the, the Native people when they get outnumbered like this. But for those years, for those 10 or 20 years, and for this very uh, uh, nice dinner, uh, at least there's a moment when there's a lot of, 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 of abundance and coming together and eating together. And I think, th I think that's a great uh, occasion to celebrate. Um, did the Indians provide squash seeds or did the pilgrims bring those seeds with them? Wasn't squash something that came from the Americas? Yes, they would elsewhere? have had, yeah, they would have, they shared their seeds with them. So um, <laughs> it's a very nice thing. Uh, yeah. By the way, we do have somebody here who is um, who is in the Winslow family line. Really? Oh, so nice. I'm so nice. That's very nice. So I, I really come to admire Winslow. He, um, he, was, he was almost like a, a conscience to, to, the, uh, to the pilgrims. So hello. Were any of the pilgrims vegetarians? You know, I think they, if whatever was on offer, they would have eaten. I mean, they were starving. So I don't think they could afford to be picky. Uh, okay, <laughs> the person who asked the question about the squash said squash was already in Spain. Was it from the Americas, Lynn? Or was, was squash originally from the Americas? That's the impression I've always had. I'm not trying yeah. to... By the way, um, I, I was telling this to, to John uh, the other day. Uh, I used to spend time in what was then the Soviet Union and I made roasted turkey. The turkeys came from Hungary and they were small by our standards, small by quite a bit, but they also trimmed away a lot of the skin. So the only way to keep the stuffing in there for roasting was simply sticking a lot of aluminum foil and toothpicks and whatever to kind of keep it in place but years later somebody who had come to that dinner in moscow uh, i visited him in prague and he said could you please make a turkey it's been my dream since <laughs> since that dinner i said sure so i we he 
we got the turkey, defrosted it, and I roasted it in the oven. And then he pulled out his Czech cookbooks and all of the Czech books, cookbooks had you boil the, um, oh. the turkey, which is why he could never replicate the meal that he had had. He had been boiling it thinking that was the approach I had taken, which I had not. Oh, well, anyway, <laughs> turkey stories. Uh, Squish was originally from the Americas, but Spain had been in, in the Americas for over 100 years by 1620. Okay, so we got that straightened yeah, good. out. Uh, good, good, just good. Just see if there's any more. Good, good, good. And, and Jamestown, people were, there were 8,000 people in Jamestown in uh, early 1607 before before the uh, before the pilgrims in 1620, so there's always this this discussion, this argument between people in Virginia and people in Massachusetts, which was which one of the settlements was the beginning of America. So it depends whether you're from Massachusetts or if you're from Virginia, I suppose. This is a question I'm not sure it's inside your but you, what the heck? So how did they produce clapboards with their mineral tools? They had this contraption. I saw a picture of it. They, they did a thing with, with their foot and a wheel and it would skim uh, wood off the, uh, the log and skim it so that it would make with a blade and make these long strips. And when you go to uh, Plymouth, the, the clapboards are all kind of wavy. They're not perfect clapboards like you get at uh, Home Depot. You know, they're uh, they're kind of wavy and moving around. So uh, that's how they made them. The thing about when they're building their houses, because I have an architecture background that I couldn't believe was I was really interested in how they built them. And, and they would have to bring their tools, get them off the Mayflower, go in, put them in a rowboat, grow all the way and the and the Mayflower was way offshore and this the waves would be coming in on them it's December in Massachusetts they're snowing and blowing and they're covered in ice and then to get onto the shore with their tools they had to jump out of the boat pull the boat and wade through the icy ocean and so that when they start building and making their clapboards and cutting down trees they're already covered in ice they're already wet and freezing. So the, the, the conditions that they built these, these houses in were really challenging. I, I hope you don't mind, but I just, because I know there's things that I could read in chat that the, there's other people that are maybe watching cannot. And they said squash was from the Americas. The word was an Algonquin word. And the Spanish took some to Spain because there was a lot of time between 1492 and 1620. So yes, squash was from the <laughs> Americas, but it spread quickly. And uh, Carrie pointed out some reports have Hubbard squash as coming through Marblehead, Massachusetts via the holds of ships from the West Indies by Captain mm -hmm. Not Martin. Wow. Um, but, uh, but re related to Jamestown, um, th this person said, uh, Cynthia said, I think the answer to the question about whether it was Jamestown or Plymouth is yes. Different parts of American culture, <laughs> but both contributors, including the fact that John Smith named New England. Oh, very good. So it's not only that we ask questions, we contribute to the answers. Very good. Uh, Scott, I think we're ready to wind up here. Uh, and thank you, John. It was terrific. Well, it's very nice uh, to see, be with everybody in Chicago again. And really, I'm very grateful to, to see you all again. And, and uh, Scott and Catherine were like uh, old friends. So, Yes, and, and someday we might actually meet. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember this was, I remember now more clearly, that you were going to come to can from Chicago from Canada, then the then the COVID started closing the borders. Yeah. Then we were we meet in the library to do a podcast because we couldn't do the program, and then meanwhile we learned how to use Zoom, and here we are. 
Here we are. <laughs> we have we haven't missed a beat. <laughs> no, not really. But thank thank you again, John, and uh, and again, can't wait to, until you find something uh, wonderful again to to write about, and uh, we want to hear about it. You do a masterful job. Well, thank you so much, Scott. That's very kind. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Chicago. Good night. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy yes. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> bye bye.